Hey everyone, uh, thank you so much for uh, sticking around after our Philadelphia Shorts program. And as you can probably see on your screen, I am surrounded by the special talent and guests uh, from all these shorts. And the fun thing is, even though there is always a Philly connection with these, everyone's kind of all over the country and the world right now at this time. That's the power of uh, Zoom right now and being able to connect with each other. Uh, so once again, if you have any questions at all, uh, feel free to submit them and I'll ask. I do ask if you have a specific question for a specific film, uh, just be sure to note that so I know who to pose the question to. And first I wanna go around and introduce everybody. So uh, first off from the, we have two people from Gabby. We have a uh, writer director, Adam Murray. Hi, I'm uh, the director, uh, <laughs> Adam, nice to meet you. And, and then we got the writer, Alexis Quasarano. Uh, yeah, good job. <laughs> Hi. Uh, then we have Derek uh, Pastusik uh, for, for uh, Islander. Hey, thanks for having me. Uh, then we have Emma Bayada, Bayada uh, from Old Young. Hey, everybody. Uh, and then from On the Fence Line, we have Kristen Harrison. Hi there. And Tara Ng. Hi. And then from The Well, we have Neil Don. Hi, everyone. And then finally, from Trash Booty, we have Iris Devins. Hi. So it's such a pleasure to have everybody in this room all at the same time. It's not usually the circumstance. Even when we do a live version, it's rare to get all the guests and talent and creative people behind these films. Um, so when starting off this conversation, I was trying to find like really good thematic connections. And I, I really found that a lot of this uh, program it's built around just human connection and whether it's the search for it, the reclaiming of it, um, the inspiration of it. But um, I would do wanna start with the two docs. So with Old Young and On the Fence Line. Um, with On the Fence Line, so you, we, that's probably our, it's our longest uh, doc in the program. And you have so many characters that uh, populate the story. How did you come to terms or how did you decide who to focus on when depicting this and why did you keep it a short? Because I feel like it has such a wealth of information and it's an ongoing story. Yeah, that, that was a conversation that we had so many times when we were sitting down to figure out what the edit would be. Um, and I think in terms of choosing whose stories to follow, um, we knew that the doc wasn't just gonna be about one person because the whole movement was about a community with these individuals who were all affected by one thing. Um, so we knew that we wanted to try to represent the community as best as we could with these individual stories. And we also felt that um, the, the people who really were living right on the fence line were the people whose stories we wanted to amplify because I think we found, especially as we, we moved on with filming it, that there was a lot of disconnect um, between people who worked at the refinery and people who lived in the community in terms of what they both were experiencing. So we definitely wanted to make sure that we amplified the stories of the people who were living there and actually being affected by the refinery. And why did you uh, decide to make it a short? Because I mean, the story is still continuing, obviously. Yeah, Kristen, I don't know. Yeah, if we're um, the four of us um, who like directed, produced, worked together. Our team we're kind of scattered throughout the country now. Um, we semi ran out of funds. You know, it's a dark world, funding, but also we had felt that this the ending that we had wanted to leave was this impression that it's a community they've banded together and we wanted to empower other communities to do the same with this film um and it's ongoing it could this story is it's not going to end anytime soon you know Hilco and the the new owner of the refinery site is causing some stir trouble already but um which Philly Thrive is is working for transparency but yeah the four of us are not all together at the moment which was something that was important to us to be together because we had always every decision that we made on this doc we kind of made together and from being in the same space so the distances 
I think been a little tough. Yeah, I think we also jumped in at this perfect moment where it was kind of right after the explosion. And that is when Philly Thrive launched this new Right to Breathe campaign. And we followed that campaign through until the end. They just launched a new one um, this weekend. Um, so we caught them right at the tail end where they were fighting to shut the refinery down and then they did. And as Kristen said, like this story could go on forever and ever and ever because these issues are not going away. Um, but it seemed like a good moment to kind of tie it together and then see what we could do with this part of the story to push it out there and see if it could inspire other people to maybe do the same. Mm -hmm. Now, you guys had a huge community, a growing community. Uh, with Old Young, Emma, you have a community of two. Um, I think it's often a lazy question, but it's really interesting with documentaries sometimes is how did you find these two? Yeah, so Ruth is actually my great aunt. Okay. Um, so I've known her my whole life. She was always sort of the quirky character in my family. Um, it wasn't until I met her friend Dave at my grand's 80th birthday. Like, what's the deal between these two people you know they seem to be on such from such different backgrounds but share such a unique relationship and I, at the beginning I thought maybe they were like romantic in nature but it became pretty clear that she was more of like a mother figure to Dave and um just endearing to see these two people navigate life together. Now you had pretty select moments in the doc because it is a pretty short runtime. How did you decide which moments to present? Because I'm sure you captured a lot more. Yeah, we actually didn't film a ton because um, I, I live in LA and I would come back um, every now and then over the course of, I think like two years to film with them. So we filmed, I think seven days total. Um, and I think there's might be a little bit from each day in there. Um, but I really wanted to center around their friendship with each other and going through production of the film, the theme of death sort of started to reveal itself. Um, so I started to try to pick moments that reflected that theme. And we, we did some pickup shoots to try to um, make sense of that theme a little bit more as well. Cool. Um, I mean, thank you for the segue uh, because death and passing and um, kind of getting uh, in touch again with someone else is a big part of some of the narratives that we uh, featured today. Um, and I find that the well and both and well and Islander both are, you know, really strong visual um, shorts and very minimal dialogue. And I want to like one, I was wondering about what was the uh, reasoning behind for each of you guys respectively and just kind of making like more of a visual poem rather than have any kind of exposition explained. If you want to go first, uh, Neil. Sure. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Um, <clears throat> I think part of it is just my instinct. Uh, I, I just tend to write minimal dialogue and I tend to delete most of the dialogue that I write. So uh, some of that just kind of comes from the writing process. Uh, you know, draft one is, no, is very little dialogue. Draft two is a lot of dialogue. Draft three is less dialogue than draft one. Uh, and so then it just kind of goes from there. Um, also, uh, you know, because it's a child's perspective, uh, I think that the dialogue in the film needed to be really uh, select and, and, and precise in, in, uh, in, these, in these ways that kind of reflected his uh, growing awareness of the world, which is something that I wanted to portray. There's, uh, there's a version where he talks to his sister when she's in the bed and, and that quickly went away. But uh, I was just more interested in trying to figure out ways to see if I could, um, or to, to show how he, uh, how he felt and how he felt about his parents and how he felt about the situation as opposed to him trying to verbally engage in ways that I thought would be sort of somewhat useless narratively anyway. So I wanted to, it was also, I guess, part of that uh, was a challenge to myself. Now, did you find it difficult to balance the kind of macabre, like, story with the childlike wonder and child perspective? Yeah, I mean, I guess so. Um, it was, yes, I mean, it's a challenge, uh, but, you know, because I really uh, wanted it to be, for me, it's kind of coming of age. It's precipice of life and death. It's both of these things. And I think that, that uh, you know, this, this kid has kind of a foot, uh, one foot in the door of wonderment and, and, uh, and awe and one foot in the door of, um, of 
you know, the state that his parents are in. And so when I was talking to him, when I was talking to the DOP, the production designer, we would always just try to figure out ways to ride that line together. Uh, so I think it was a challenge, but it was a really fun challenge of the film. And, and I hope that he grows up a little bit over the course of it. Yeah. And uh, so back to the original question with you, Derek. Um, it's, it's a very like minimal dialogue, uh, maybe even just a couple lines besides like kind of radio chatter. And what was the thinking behind that? Um, it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily deliberate. Like I, I think like Neil said, in, the instinct was there at the beginning. Um, I mean, like, I think the cheapest answer I could give you is it was out of necessity because it was just myself, the cinematographer and the actor. So having a third person, you know, a third set of hands to hold a boom pole just wasn't uh, in the cards for us. But I mean, it, it wasn't just like that dictated the creative decision. I think uh, Nick, the cinematographer and I knew that this was gonna be a quiet film and we kind of found the story as we shot it. And a lot of the story uh, with my editor, Yuri, we also found in the edit. So it was like necessity driven, but then we tried to like capitalize on that and capture capture the feeling. And at the, you know, at the heart of this story is about somebody who's kind of trapped in that vacuum of post-tragedy. So it should be quiet for a little bit, I would argue. And like, that's kind of, that was sort of like the, the instinct that then became, you know, narrative execution in terms of the dialogue stuff. Uh, and then we ended up kind of leaning on the dialogue a little bit, which I kind of liked that he's sort of, this character sort of is silent for the first couple of minutes and then slowly gains his voice again. And I, I thought that was like, I really liked that aspect of it in, as we were playing with it. So, um, but yeah, I mean, like it was like half necessity cause we were like broke film students at the time, but, uh, and then it was like half, like, let's, let's see if we can, you know, the challenge aspect that Neil was talking about resonates with me as well. Now, was it difficult for you or for the actor to kind of be shaping the film as you went, like while shooting it and especially in post-production cause you know, it already happened. Right. Uh, how, what was that experience like? Uh, it was very chaotic. I mean, for a number of reasons beyond just like the filmmaking that Nick and I were both like really, really sick at the time. Cause we were, we, we went to grad school out here and then we flew back to uh, out here, meaning Los Angeles. And then we flew back to the East coast to shoot this thing where we're both from. And we were both like kind of sick and making this movie. And it was just, I mean, luckily he and I, um, communicated about, we were going to be as loose as possible and just sort of grab this actor who we really loved. And just, we were very upfront with him that we're just gonna kind of mine moments and we'll stitch them together later. So we like backloaded the sort of like, you know, encumbering narrative thinking. Um, but I mean, yeah, like we were kind of kicking ourselves as, as we were going through the footage, like, oh, man, we didn't recognize that moment, but it was chaotic and fun. And it was just like a total exploration of like that moment in time and that landscape. So. I mean, it was, you know, luckily we were able to sort of stitch together moments that looked like they made sense, but like at the time it was very chaotic and we were just kind of getting footage that we thought resonated and then going from there. Cool. Well, then that leaves us with our two final narratives. Um, these are not silent protagonists, I'll say that much. Um, first off with Trash Booty, um, I don't know for you, everyone who's on the panel or people watching right now, um, Hitchbot or the hobo uh, robot was a real thing that Philly, you know, let die. <laughs> I believe set on fire. I meant to let, I was like Googling at the last second before uh, this thing, but I just, I couldn't find a straight answer what exactly happened, but I remember Philly was the last thought. Um, and Iris, I wanna ask, um, when you were shaping the story uh, with your two characters, was it, was it their relationship and their evolving relationship that became, that was first? Or was it the robot that kind of was the catalyst that got you thinking about their interaction and what it meant to be kind and like, you know, pay it forward? Um, I would say that I started with the characters being the protagonist was sort of my, my starting point. And kind of the backstory to that is I had done another short with the trans lead that was a much um, heavier topic and I wanted to do something that was fun and, you know, was a lot more playful than what I had done before. So. I um, had been doing some writing with a feature and some of the feedback I got was the side story that I had in the feature uh, between two trans best friends was working really well. So I took that dynamic and I brought it into a different story. Um, and I was always fascinated by the story of Hitchbot. Um, 
And so kind of the, the sort of setup was what if the last two people who saw Hitchpa alive were these two dumpster diving trans women. Um, the opening scene where the, um, <clears throat> one of the leads, um, Cat, who's played by Michelle Henley, is jumping out of the dumpster kind of in slow motion. So that was actually inspired by a true event um, that happened to me. Um, so I always thought that would be a cool scene in a movie. Um, you know, it is a fictional film, but I just, um, you know, there were some small pieces in it. But I would say in terms of the starting point, it, it was definitely about character. Character matters a lot to me um, in terms of how I write and kind of my style of filmmaking. Yeah. And I, I love the sound, the sound effects during that moment and the music for the whole thing gave it such style. It was great. Uh, and then finally for Adam and Alexis, sorry, I'm like looking around the grid. Um, so you guys, it's a very much a moment uh, for your character. We don't really get to know just the little like visual hints and the initial phone call. We don't really get to know too much about the character, um, but why did you decide this is the moment to focus on? Um, I mean, I'll defer to Alexis too, but I, I thought up the idea because I had just like done a short that was like an experimental test and I wanted to do like one more thing before going into 2020, not expecting a pandemic to hit uh, the entire world. I was like, oh, let me go back and like make like a, a sh like a comedic short because that's why I started doing in Philly when I moved to LA. That's what I was doing. And so I reached out to Alexis. I was like, is there anything to the idea of a highlighting like toxic fan culture where fans in the past few years especially with the rise of twitter have been taking ownership of like franchises and films that aren't theirs and telling the creators what's wrong with it and and she was like yes absolutely so that's where alexis then ran with it and uh, there's anything you want to add yeah i wanted to focus like on that moment because i felt like her the our main character her backstory could be changed with any other creator and it didn't really matter where she was coming from or what she was creating i mean it does but just like it could have been anyone especially like as a woman like on twitter i deal with a lot of terrible people in my replies um and so i just really wanted to like focus on like what if that was real like what if a reply guy really came into my house and told me everything that was wrong with what I was writing and yeah. And why the kind of artistic style I want to say inspiration by Kathy? Yeah. That was Are you guys big fans of Kathy? Uh, uh, I've <laughs> become a big fan of Kathy over so I ended up reading and like just going through a lot of Kathy and I drew up the original uh, few like rough drafts and I then gave it to Mike Mayfield who's a friend of mine who is uh, an U arts grad as well um, and he just ran with it and he was like I've had like a Kathy comic in my back pocket for years so like one of the like strips that's hanging up is like an actual strip that he like drew all out but I I got really into Kathy um, our actress Deanna read uh, the autobiography of Catherine Guesswhite, who is the creator of Kathy. So for about two to three months, I was, we were all, I would say, very deep into Kathy lore. Cool. Um, so I got a question uh, for Derek from Islander. You filmed a short a few years ago and released it to film festivals this year. How has the theme of solo and slash isolation resonated during this pandemic? Oh yeah, so that was an un like in the process. That was a total unintentional coincidence that this film kind of spoke to that. But I mean, I I, I was talking with somebody about this the other day. I just think uh, like our default state as human beings is like being alone. Like we're we're just kind of going through this crazy ride solo. Uh, so it's just for me like I don't. It wasn't necessarily a choice to to do that, but I, I enjoyed, um, I enjoyed sort of exploring the, what is the, what makes, you know, what makes solitude solitude versus loneliness? Like, is there a peace to be found in being alone? Like that kind of thing. Um, and then of course, like what, when you're isolated and alone, what makes you not feel those things is connecting to someone or someone or something in this case. So, uh, it was, it, it just felt like, the moment we got on, we shot this on Long Beach Island in the winter, so really nobody was there. So it really just felt like as soon as we got there, 
we were like, this is, we're just going to have to capture him alone. And it's just going to be like the landscape and the setting sort of dictated that. But I mean, in terms of what it speaks to today, I think everybody's kind of feeling those resonant feelings of being alone and being isolated. Uh, and I believe that what gives us hope going forward is that we can still connect, you know, we can find ways like this to connect and meet people and, uh, you know, connect, like you, you had said, Trey, at the top of this, like, human connection is the theme of this group of films. So it's very much like, you know, I'm glad that it provided like the tiniest little percentage of an antidote to that sentiment of feeling alone these days. So yeah, but a total coincidence that, you know, I just happened to be finishing this movie and like I did the last sound mix like on March 10th. And as we all know, like that was the week when things day by day deteriorated and it became this pandemic. So it was like, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't thinking about that at all, but I'm happy to kind of like throw that into the cauldron of like, you know, maybe this is a way for a moment to feel a little less alone these days. Yeah, it's been astounding, even just from where you just started the festival, um, people revisiting their work they filmed before this and seeing how it's a little different. And so that goes to my next question. Uh, with Neil, um, some of you might not know, uh, Neil is not in the United States right now. He's over in Prague, right? Yeah. Um, so especially with your film, having a person sick in a bed definitely resonates a little differently and having that be like one of the first things you see, first images. But the question I have for the audience is, uh, what are the differences of being, of filming in Europe versus the States as like an independent filmmaker? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think there are definitely, it's a different system. Uh, it's a, probably a very, very long answer that's also probably quite boring, but it's, uh, <laughs> um, you know, systems of financing, et cetera, are, are really different. Uh, I, I think I think one of the primary differences that I've experienced, though, uh, it's a generalization, but it, nonetheless, it's one that I've experienced is that uh, American filmmakers, um, uh, I don't know if this is if this is even good to say, whatever. Um, I think there's I think I think it comes I think emotion tends to come first in Europe and story comes first in America. And that's a huge generalization. I understand that. But I think if you're going to look at things generally, at least that's how film is is perceived and and received here, and uh, and so um, there's a little bit of an adjustment just in the way that I learned cinema and learned to think about my own cinema. So from a personal standpoint, there was absolutely an adjustment that way. Just thinking about um, you know what a character feels and how and why they feel it, even even prior to necessarily. Uh, narrative steps uh, or plotting and uh and and i i like that i mean I've, I've grown i've grown used to it i think that's um that's that's maybe uh one of the biggest things just from a from a directing standpoint so is there are there producers also being like because often you hear in america like give me more story <laughs> yeah there's not a purpose here give me more story are the producers <laughs> being like it's the story give me more emotion or yeah. like you yeah. Be more silent. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Tone it down. Yeah. Um, uh, I think yes, actually. Uh, you know, again, of course, uh, you can find all sorts of producers here, uh, including those that would be story first. Absolutely. Um, but, but certainly, uh, I think that there is this. Uh, some of it is just the cinematic traditions that are originated in Europe and are still strong. And, uh, and I think that they have a lot in common with US film, but also uh, diverge. And, and I think that's one of the divergent um, thrusts. And yeah, I think a lot of producers are looking for things that are maybe more tonal than anything else. Hmm. I have another question, let's see. Um, about sound playing an important role. And we talked a little bit about that, how there's like a little bit of lack of dialogue. Um, this is specifically for Neil, but I would love to open up to the rest of you guys. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you think about your use of sound as a writer and director? Um, Cause there's so little bit of dialogue. Yeah, I mean, sound, sound was super important in this film. Um, going in, I knew that I, I wanted three sounds in the house and I knew that I wanted them to disappear one by one. And I knew that I wanted them to disappear at key moments. And so they, they, were, they were slight dialogue replacements I knew I wanted them all to be diegetic existing in the world of the film. 
And so the, the water dropping was written into the script, the beeping of the EKG machine was written into the script. And then when we location scouted, we found the, um, the kind of static on the television, which we liked because it sort of matched the, um, you know, maybe like a heart rate monitor or something visually. So, so they were just there from the, from the outset. And I knew I wanted to kind of fill the world with some noise, but not overwhelm the world. And then um, uh, kind of like drawing in a sharp breath, just pull them out one at a time and then hit, hit a moment of absolute silence, which we do right when he pulls the needle out, there's zero sound, uh, which was the sound designer's idea. And I really liked it. And then, and then um, kind of build sound uh, uh, back in. And then the exterior sound should be entirely different and, uh, and should, should not have those layers. It should have just been all, all kind of one cohesive world. Cool. Now, um, Iris, a lot of the sound in your films is not part of the world. Um, I, I believe, I can't recall specific ones, but I feel like there's some like boingings and like different just like spring sounds. Um, can you talk about that a little bit? Like, was that just to add a little bit of flair or does that exist in these characters' worlds? Um, so the idea, and this was coming from talking to the sound designer, was to kind of uh, build up the playfulness and kind of um, uh, build up sort of a stylized sort of sound world. Um, so I guess it's kind of an in-between of diegetic and, and non-diegetic sound. I mean, some of it does kind of match, but it's it sort of built up the existing sound that would have been there diegetically. I mean, to get, I guess, to answer your question, if it was in the world or not, but, you know, the idea was to play it up in a way that felt um, playful and not necessarily uh, like um, kind of like brutal realism um, mm -hmm. in terms of the sound design. And then kind of continuing on with sound, then, then again with the music, the idea was to build up something that again was playful, that kind of built up the tone of the world. Um, and so we spent like with Anthony, I think, probably two weeks working on that score. Um, we were working on it in my house, kind of doing synthesizers. Um, was sort of the idea from, from the whole get-go. Um, but I don't know, I don't know how to say more about it, but um, yeah, that was kind of the idea was just building up this sort of world that wasn't so much built into maybe realism. Now, Emma, did your great aunt, was she mic'd up? Did she, or? Like, how did you uh, go about capturing these guys? Yeah, we had lavalier micro microphones on her and Dave for most of our shoots. Um, if we were inside of our house, it's such a contained space that we were just using a shotgun on the camera. Um, but for the most part, we had, we had little mics on her. And she was really cool about it. At the beginning, she was a little bit wary for sure. But as we progressed with filming, she was pretty comfortable with the film. and was much more able to sort of uh, forget our presence than Dave was. Dave was quite a ham through the filming and, it went, and had fun with it, so. And how did the two of them react to the uh, final product? Oh, they loved it. Dave actually came to the premiere at Slamdance and people were like asking him for autographs and selfies and he was having a blast and yeah. Awesome. Uh, for On the Fence Line and also for Old Young, um, we have a question about, is it absolutely insane to get into the doc work uh, in US right now? Or is it a good time because people are looking for more film during a pandemic? I think that it's a good time to get into doc. Um, if you're choosing between doc and narrative, I think doc is a lot more accessible. You can have smaller crews. Um, you know, if you're making a character driven film, it can sort of, you can create an isolation pod with your character and might be an even a nice way to get that intimacy quicker. Um, so I would say it's a good time. And for the fence line crew? Yeah, I think I agree with that. I, th I think you definitely have to make sure that you're doing this responsibly and that um, everyone, you know, is on board um, with being in that space together. Um, but definitely like the nature of our film was very um, intimate so we would have like two crew members go and spend a day shooting so it's definitely possible I mean I think it's a really good time if you're trying to make put more work into the world um, right now yeah um, I have an, what, another question from the audience I'm going to start with Gabby uh, the team from Gabby but if anyone else wants to chime in afterwards feel free 
Um, so we have, as a younger generation of filmmakers, uh, has the normalization of digital communication changed the way in which you guys have advanced or expressed your art? In terms of just like, uh, since we're all online all the time now. <laughs> yeah, because I guess there's always that question, do you show the cell phone screen in films these days? Because that's what everyone sees half their day, but no one, but does anyone actually want to see that on screen? <laughs> I, I don't think so. And I think it's also very hard, um, I think nowadays, if you're trying to write or work on something and like in like any kind of sense where it's like, why didn't, like in ours, it's like, why didn't she just call the police or anything like that? Like when the person's in their house, I, I think it, there is the like prol proliferation of technology has made it harder in terms of screenwriting and directing for finding loopholes that you can put characters like through, uh, especially like in horror genre. I think uh, it's made things a lot harder. Um, I, I'm with my job and my day job, I'm on the internet all the time, like almost every day. Uh, and so I enjoy times when I don't have to be doing that. And I think a lot of people have that same kind of experience, people who are in our age group and our demographic, because most jobs now are, especially working from home, you're on the computer every single day. But I think a lot of people, I think when a cell phone doesn't show up in a movie, people don't even notice it for the most part. I think it's a beautiful thing where people are not saying like, well, wh why isn't she on the phone? Why is she doing this? And so that's, I mean, that's my personal <laughs> input on it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I at least I notice for myself, if I notice a character not on the phone, I'm just like, oh, that must be nice not to like have to constantly check your phone. And I'm like kind of jealous of that character, um, not having that anxiety that I suffer from. Um, but if I'm like writing a scene that involves like a text message or some kind, I try to switch it, excuse me, switch it over to like FaceTime. And that way it's easier to write just like, cause you can do quick back and forths or even just like have the other actor on actual FaceTime. So I try to stick to that if I'm gonna have like a mobile conversation while writing. But do you think um, you're abandoning the truth and reality? Um, I mean, I, like for myself, I prefer talking on the phone. Like I text all the time, but like, if I'm going to talk, like I called Adam last night on my drive home. Uh, I just, I enjoy talking on the phone. So that's what I, I enjoy writing, I guess. <laughs> and Iris, I believe you just, yeah. Yeah. Hi, I was wanting to jump in. So kind of a, a different angle on it, because this is a topic I'm kind of passionate about. Um, so for fun, like that means, you know, walking with the dog or not being in front of the screen, but when it comes to work um, and in terms of process and not just what I'm, you know, what my characters are doing, but in terms of work, um, what digital communication has done for me has been just outstanding in terms of, um, for example, I'm really dedicated to a lot of the looks, you know, from aesthetics from film, from, you know, analog formats. However, as an indie filmmaker financially, that's often not accessible to me or practical. So I've, you know, through digital communication, been able to be clued into processes of say, rebuilding looks from film, um, just by the knowledge that's out there. Stevie Edlund, for example, to DP has been um, particularly vocal about this topic and how you can kind of rebuild the aesthetics of film through digital, but also VFX, for example, like you may not look at and think of trashy booties of VFX film, but it actually has a ton of VFX, particularly where Hitchbot's body was found um, and kind of where, he where Hitchbot died in the film is where, where Hitchbot's real body was found. And it happens to be on the corner of one of the most touristy districts of, of you know, in Philadelphia. It was an awful shooting condition where there was tourists, there was buses, there's all kinds of stuff. And I had to paint so many people out. And learning how to do that was possible for me, you know, by just what I have access to as an independent filmmaker today with digital knowledge. And ironically, that whole process as painful as it was led to me getting a gig doing a VFX compositing job on a feature, you know, but that's kind of, as a filmmaker in terms of work, that's what it's done for me. But as an individual, I, I value my freedom away from the screen. That's really cool. I mean, cause that was right near, what is it? The oldest street in America, or, right? Is that what the uh, location was? 
Yeah, and that was one of the most difficult shooting locations I've ever had. Um, it was really tough. Um, I could go on about it, but just all I'll say is if, if the scene was pulled off by, you know, VFX work and being able to, to clean the scene up. And so, you know, a lot of VFX is, you know, not just like bringing dragons into a screen or something, but I'm a, I'm a big fan of, say, David Fincher's approach to VFX, which is using VFX to serve the story and VFX that you don't necessarily see. Yeah. Um, um, but, you know, for me, that's kind of what digital um, access has done, done for me personally. Sorry, I have a call. I'm not turning that off. Um, speaking of digital, um, but yeah, I mean, I could go on and on and on about this topic. But. Um, I got another question. Um, this will probably be the last one from the audience, and I would love to hear you guys' um, future projects and future of this, your individual projects here. But um, for the doc filmmakers, um, how do you establish yourself as being around all the time in order to get what you need as a doc filmmaker? Um, so yeah, like living in with your subjects, um, getting comfortable with them, but any mistakes you've made you suggest not to do? I think one of the most important things is to form a relationship with them before you start filming. Um, really get to know them as people and show them that they can trust you and that you can trust them. Um, and in my, in my style of filmmaking, I like to to take a more observational approach. So I sort of let them um, guide the process to some degree. They come to me when they have something they wanna share. Um, try not to like overstep my boundaries too much. Um, but then that also maybe leads me to my mistake. Whereas I like let the leash be a little bit too long. And I guess there are things that I see have happened in someone's life that I wish that um, I hadn't known about at that time. So I think it's just finding that, that balance between uh, not overstepping your boundary, but also like being present um, and yeah, around. Any advice um, from on the fence line from Kristen and Tara? Yeah, we, I think that was something that we struggled with because we were um, students at Ithaca College at the time, and this is a part of our thesis. So we were commuting back and forth from New York on our weekends and during our breaks. And I think we had wanted to be a lot more present than we were, but we tried to be there every opportunity we could, you know, said one part, two people, three people, maybe not our full crew um, for a day. And for us, it it looked like showing up in ways that were went beyond filming um, to, you know, as Emma said, develop that relationship with the people that we were filming and with Philly Thrive. Um, that looked like spending our Saturdays planting trees with them and and canvassing with them and, and helping them with fundraisers. Um, and so, yeah, I think in order to develop that relationship, I think you have to show that you're invested in what they're doing and their mission in our case. So that's what that looked like for us. Cool. I don't, to yeah, Eric. And I also, sorry. <laughs> um, I also feel like with the story that we were also working with, I mean, we were, we were trying to figure out how to represent the story of this entire community. And that was impossible to do without understanding the full scope of that community. So we went down on weekends, but we would spend most of our time just hanging out with people and talking to them um, without cameras. So there were a lot of times where we would go down and we would not really have anything to show for the weekend in terms of footage, but that really helped our shoots later on. Um, when we did need to go in and get things, we knew exactly who to talk to and we had formed relationships with people um, so that we could do that. Um, I also, I recently watched a Q&A with Garrett Bradley who directed Time, which is a really awesome film. And something she said was that um, whenever she is starting to film with anyone, she asks them, why do you want me, or why are you letting me follow you around with a camera? Which is a really interesting take on just figuring out like what the people in your film, like what their stakes are. Um, so I think from now on, like that's something that I would like to do. <laughs> um, Cause that's not something that I don't think we asked. We definitely tried to make sure that we um, had like a relationship of transparency in doing that. Um, but yeah. Awesome. Yeah, everyone go see Time. I think it's on Amazon Prime right now, right? Yeah, <laughs> cool. And so just to, uh, in this conversation, um, I'll start with Derek. Um, what's the future of this project and your filmmaking career? Oh, well, this project will hopefully continue on to do, you know, a run for the next year or so. I mean, I, I 
the climate is so uncertain that <laughs> who knows what, like maybe I'll end up putting it up online in a couple of months, maybe it'll be another year, but um, you know, I, I just, I just sent it to a few festivals that I felt like it would resonate with audiences given the, you know, where it was shot and what it's about. But um, beyond that, uh, I'm working, I mean, I'm currently taking out like my first feature, like a script I've written and it's like, you know, hopefully going to get packaged this fall. But again, it's like, uh, you know, I'm sure everybody has kind of experienced his or her own version of this, but um, like it, people aren't, it's a little tepid in terms of people committing to to projects right now, especially with like emerging t talent, excuse me, solely because, you know, like what has happened to the industry has made uh, this sort of gatekeepers a little more risk averse, but I'm remaining, you know, as optimistic as possible and uh, just trying to hustle and get the, get that feature script out there. So hopefully in the next year, as this short kind of tails off on its festival run, I'll be able to sort of gear up and, and start shooting something in about a year safely. I mean, I'm very, you know, I'm very afraid of the idea of people rushing back for economic reasons and, you know, threatening people's safety and threatening lives, God forbid. So um, we'll just have to see, but I'm remaining hopeful and optimistic in the projects and, and trying to push those along, you know, when possible. Cool. Uh, Neil, are you ever coming back to America? Are you coming back to Philly? <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, Philly is home. Uh, we will we'll be back in Philly in 2021. And uh, what's the future of the wealth? Uh, well, it's it's uh, got a few more festivals that it's into uh, that it's been accepted to, I should say, that are coming up. Uh, most of them are either online or hybrid. One actually already got pushed to 2021 entirely. So, like Derek said, the uncertainty abounds. <laughs> um, uh, but I, yeah, uh, a very similar answer. Otherwise, uh, I, I, it'll play at those fests, and then and then I'll see. Uh, I'm not sure uh, if this is the year to keep pushing out to festivals, or if this is the year to uh, uh, let it let it do the ones that it has remaining scheduled, and then and then put it on Vimeo. I'll sort of decide when. I don't know when when I decide. Yeah, I mean, hey, if the festivals keep getting pushed back, it extends like. The lifetime or the season of the uh, film. True. A year. Yeah, true. Usually, it's like a, around a year for a lot of films. Exactly. Um, for the Gabby crew, uh, what's the future of Gabby and your other projects? Uh, so every now and again, like we'll see someone like we'll tweet something like when it plays like digitally in a festival. Who've been like, I want to see a feature of this, which I, I think Alexis would have a better idea of how to turn into a feature. I, do you have a better idea? <laughs> Like, I didn't know people were saying that. So that's oh yeah, cool. <laughs> yeah. Look at the letter. The letterbox has been popping off. Oh, okay. Um, for for me, uh, I'm kind of in the same uh, realm as Derek. I've been like workshopping a feature that's an adaptation of a Carl Hyacinth book, but I don't want to jump back into anything because I like don't want to risk putting people's lives at stake. So I've just been kind of just thankfully this our film has taken off and it's been a nice mental uh, refresher in a time when I can't go out and direct something. But as for me, just kind of building up and getting a feature script and like pitch package into a place and Alexis has her own stuff going on too. Uh, yeah, I mean, that would be an interesting idea to explore Gabby as a feature, but uh, for now, yeah, I'm like in no rush to get back on set or have anyone getting sick. Um, so I've just kind of been like writing here and there also because it's hard to write right now. I don't know if anyone else is having that struggle. Um, it's a real awkward, terrible time to be creative. Um, so yeah, I'm just kind of playing with some ideas for some shorts that could be fun after this is over. So just kind of working on that and trying to just like stay mentally stable and sane. Iris, are you staying sane over there in West Philly? Yeah, I'm good. And what's the uh, future of uh, Trash Booty? Um, I guess specifically Trashy Booty, I would say um, I was fortunate to, even though things got pushed back to premiere and you know screen at some festivals I really wanted to and including Philadelphia Film Festival. And I'm just happy about that. And 
I don't know how I am with films. It's like, I just want to get things out and then just let it go. So I might be at a stage where I just want to put online and let people see it because I feel like I've gotten what I want out of it. I guess I'll decide. But for me, what I'm really excited about is, um, you know, with the pandemic hitting, I said yes to every gig I could get. And I was just slammed with work for a bit. And what I have right now is I just want an open window to write and work on development. I have a new feature that I'm working on. And I have a secret project that's like a experimental music video that's VFX heavy that I shot right before the pandemic hit. So whenever I feel an itch to do something that's more specifically with filmmaking, um, it's gonna be a lot of post work. So I can you know, dig into that. But what I'm really excited about myself is, is working on new things. Um, I guess by the time people see anything I've made, the curse I say is they're looking at kind of the past of you know where my mind was at and my mind's on different things right now and Tara and Kristen what about you so I mean I keep going just make a feature out of this but what's the uh and I know you talked about it a little bit yeah we had initially we had wanted to do um like a lot of community screenings um in Philadelphia and other places where you know where refineries are president present not president sorry but um yeah, especially in South Philly, we just wanted to get people together to watch the film in the community, but it, it just never happened. So we're hoping that one day when things are better off, we can do that. Um, in the future, we had just talked the other day about the, <laughs> the four of us who had worked on the film. We were like, let's all get an apartment in Philly and just keep making docs in Philly forever. Wouldn't that be great? But yeah, we're a little spread out right now. So looking forward to when we can all be in person again. So yeah. Well, it'd be great to have yeah. you guys down here. <laughs> we hope so one day. <laughs> and then finally, Emma, um, what's the future? So you said Slam Dance, which congratulations on that. Um, but any other future festivals um, in the future? I actually think this might be the last one. It's been almost a year. Um, since this has been on the circuit. So the film is available on No Budge and on the Slam Dance channel, which they launched this summer. Um, they have a lot of other films that played at the festival on a YouTube channel, um, which is super cool. So I think, I think this is the last one. Thanks for having me. Cool. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you everyone for taking the time to uh, join us today. This has been great. I know, it, what, is it two o'clock in the morning now at this point? Yeah, one one forty seven. 147. Cool. Well, thank you to everyone on the West Coast, in Prague, up in New York and Philly. Um, this has been a great treat. I, this is only the second year. I don't know if you saw the intro, but it's only the second year of the Philadelphia Shorts program. So it's very exciting to do. And uh, two films went on the Sundance last year, so you never know. <laughs> but uh, thanks again, guys. And thank you to the audience. See ya. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Drake.